Lesson number two, primary concerns. Part number one, joint formation and joint ownership. Welcome to the lesson number two, where we will begin dissecting the primary concerns surrounding joint ventures. These concerns are joint formation and ownership, joint operation and management, uh, joint termination and exit strategies. Whether a joint venture is between two small local businesses or multiple large international corporations, the concerns are always the same, all by on different scales. In this lesson, we will be focusing on the concerns regarding the foundation of a joint venture, namely joint venture and joint ownership. Let's talk about the business scope of a joint venture. During the formation phase, the full scope must be agreed in advance upon by all parties. The business scope must define the business activities the joint venture will be involved in and its functions. This includes but is not limited to research and development functions, manufacturing capabilities, marketing and distribution. It is essential that operations critical to the joint venture are not dependent on specific parties to function. In certain geographic markets, the parties involved may combine their contributions to be more effective. The scope also includes defining the duration of the joint venture. Many joint ventures are indefinite. However, others are limited to a duration specified in the business scope. The exact regulations of defining business scope vary based on government regulations and their tax codes. But generally speaking, once this business scope is defined, the joint venture can only operate within that scope. Some potential joint ventures never make it past this stage if the parties hit roadblocks and cannot reach an agreement. This phase is essential to building a successful joint venture. One important thing to know that there are variety of joint ventures which are actually not classical one, but delayed two-step acquisitions. This is when one party, the acquirer, buys interest in a business and contractually agrees to buy the remaining portion later on. The remaining portion of interest is then bought after a certain amount of time or once certain conditions are met, so-called conditions precedent. Delayed buyouts may occur for several reasons. For example, the acquirer might need more time to pay the full purchase price. Or it might be that the acquirer does not have the exact expertise or functions already set up. Instead, they will need to rely on the seller's resources for a certain amount of time. Sometimes part of the purchase price is tied to the joint venture profitability and calculated with what's called an earn out formula. Other times, it's as simple as the seller wanting to gain some kind of benefit from the joint venture instead of just the profits from a wholesale. Next up, we'll be discussing the contributions of each party and what that involves in more detail. During the joint formation and ownership stage, the contributions of each party must be specified exactly in written. These contributions may be via financial assets, businesses technology, research facilities, or other infrastructure. The business scope determines the assets or businesses contributed by each party. Contributions are made in various ways, including the transfer of assets or equity in certain entities or both of them. It's extremely important that this step is done correctly. Separating assets in a joint venture is like a divorce on a massive scale. It's expensive, time-consuming, and very complicated. To keep it as smooth as possible, there are certain guidelines that need to be followed. And these guidelines include, number one, if an asset is used by only one business, it is allocated to that business. Number two, each party needs to own and control its own assets. If assets are shared, they need to be divided when possible. Number three, if shared assets cannot be divided, they should be allocated to whichever party uses the assets the most. The other party can use the assets based on certain agreement stipulations. Number four, for assets that definitely cannot be separated, they need to be dealt with before their official contribution date. 
Number five, special circumstances will always arise when dealing with certain assets, like physical property and intellectual one. Once these assets are identified, their value and what each party will receive in exchange for them must be determined. As you've probably guessed, when it comes to valuing each contribution, there are many factors involved. First off, it's vital for the parties to know if the financial information they have access to is correct and sufficient. They need to have full disclosure and access to all information, including profitability and all tax implications. As you can imagine, if the financial information available is not accurate, it can severely impact valuation efforts. Especially on larger scale, being off by a small percentage or margin can drastically change the valuation. It's also important to evaluate what's called stand-alone profitability, which determines the profit of the joint venture on its own. To ensure the financial information all of the parties have is accurate, certain steps are generally followed. These steps usually include the preparation of audited financial statements contributed by each party. The accountants for the other parties can then review those financial statements. If there are disputes between accountants, independent firms are usually hard for binding arbitration. To make things easier, all of these steps should be taken before signing the joint venture contract. If they are taken after the contracts have been signed, a post-closing adjustment will be needed, but it's very complicated. Obviously, tax considerations and implications also come into play throughout the process of developing a joint venture. The tax burden of the joint venture itself must be determined, but there are other factors too. First of all, each party needs to determine the tax burden of their contributed assets or business alone. They will also need to determine the cost involved in restructuring and contributing those assets to the joint venture. As I previously mentioned, this tax burden varies greatly based on location, jurisdiction of the joint venture, and tax regulations of specific country. Generally speaking, the largest tax burdens involve cross-border transfers. And here we need to keep in mind the effects of double tax treaties signed between different countries. However, income taxes from new assets or relieved liabilities, transfer taxes, capital contribution taxes, and many others need to be calculated and accounted for. There are certain ways for these taxes to be minimized legally. This can include assigning lower values to certain transfers, but this can influence depreciation values in the future. Each individual tax jurisdiction determines what is needed in terms of valuations, appraisals, audits, and other court filings. Next, we'll be digging into the legalities and taxes in more details. One of the most important parts of starting a business of any kind is determining the legal form of the company. Joint ventures can be established as a corporation, as a limited liability company, or as a partnership. They can also be established as a contractual agreement, also that is slightly less common, but in different countries they have like this kind of civil society without having a corporation form. As with any business, the legal form of a joint venture is decided based on multiple factors. And here is the role of lawyers, accountants, and tax advisors to determine what is the best solution for the joint venture for a specific country. Joint venture parties must first consider tax implications, as well as internal structures and organizational operations. They also need to consider exit strategy, the limited liability of the parties, and other liabilities the joint venture may entail. As we've already discussed, many of the factors I've just mentioned vary based on the jurisdiction of the joint venture and its tax implications. Knowing the tax implications is vital to forming a successful joint venture. The most common tax implications considered are capital gain tax, local and international taxes, and minimizing recurring taxation. Let's go into a bit more detail here, because while taxes are not the most interesting thing to talk about, they are some of the most important.
When it comes to capital gain tax, this include transfers or other similar taxes. These other taxes could be the original contribution of assets or businesses to the joint venture, the restructuring of the original contribution of those assets, or the bailout in the case of a two-step acquisition like we talked about in the lesson number 2B. Local and international tax implications are also considered and are exactly as they sound. Also for international taxes, it's a bit more complicated. This is because international taxation for joint ventures often include the withholding of taxes based on treaties between countries or tax jurisdictions. This impacts everything from net income to taxable income in other jurisdictions. Here it's very important to take into account where is the residence of the joint venture, in which country. As I've already mentioned, minimizing recurring tax taxation is also an important factor. These recurring taxes are based on everything from the joint venture's operations, and this includes income, as well as royalties, distribution of equity, other taxes related to the parties on an individual level also. As we just discussed, taxes play a large role in deciding a joint venture's legal form. This is why many joint ventures are partnerships rather than corporations or LLC, because they want to apply the principle of looking through the entity and pay taxes at the level of partners. As a partnership, the joint venture is not required to pay entity level tax. There is also nothing equivalent to corporate dividends, so uh, distribution to each party is not taxable. In a partnership, the joint venture's taxable income or its losses go to the parties directly. In this case, the parties have far more flexibility and can move around assets via contributions or other distributions with no gain, meaning no taxes. Another benefit is that in a partnership, the parties involved in the joint venture are able to use any net losses from it to offset either the party's external income or its income from the joint venture. While a partnership is generally more advantageous, a corporation is generally more complicated and has more downsides. Not only is it far less flexible, but dreaded double taxation also comes into play when a joint venture is legally a corporation. In this case, the joint venture's income is taxed at the entity level, while distributions are taxed by each party. One of the other large downsides is that, unlike in partnerships, in corporations, the parties involved cannot cut their losses by offsetting their joint venture losses. The one exception to this is if the party itself is a corporation. In that case, if the party owns, let's say, over 80% of the joint venture stock, they can include the joint venture losses on a consolidated tax return. Now we have already spoken about how location and individual tax jurisdictions are vital to know when forming a joint venture. Let's dive into that a bit more. When we talk about the location of a joint venture, we are first and foremost talking about the location of its headquarters where the main substance of the business is present. The first thing to know is that the location of the joint venture's headquarters and the location where the joint venture was established are often different. This is where things get complicated, especially for large international joint ventures or corporations. The joint venture may have been established in one country by parties from two other countries. Then its headquarters may be a different country and its facilities may be in yet another country. Needless to say, it's times like these people are grateful for tax lawyers. When joint ventures are spread out amongst multiple countries and tax jurisdictions, everything from where board meetings are held to employee preferences must be considered. To tie back to the tax minimization we discussed earlier, this is also relevant to how a joint ventures had quarter functions. Everything from how it's financed and supported to how it conducts trade is intentional. To minimize international or double taxation as much as possible, joint ventures often rely on tax-advantaged jurisdictions. These are locations where taxes are minimized based on certain criteria. Now that we've got a handle on the legal forms of joint ventures, 
and influence on taxation, let's move on to ancillary agreements. But before we go to the next lesson, I recommend you to take a short break. So up to now, we covered an enormous amount of important information. So please make sure you understand everything so far before moving on. Part 2e. Today we are talking about ancillary agreements. As a refresher, ancillary agreements are agreements that are subordinate to the main agreements. They often include long and complicated negotiations. If the process of creating these agreements, antitrust analysis, ensures the agreements are in fact necessary for the joint venture. Ancillary agreements include everything from employee agreements to factory different lease agreements. Employee agreements could relate to general employment, payroll, or different administrative issues. Ancillary agreements are also often used for intellectual property, marketing, sales, research and development, and manufacturing. They are also used for distribution and supply chain and other general commercial matters, including leases and commercial property agreements. Let's go into a bit more detail about intellectual property agreements, as they are some of the most important and complicated ones. The four main kinds of intellectual property are copyrights, trademarks, patents, and trade secrets. However, intellectual property also includes inventions, trade names, artistic works, designs, images, computer software, and different data. When it comes to joint ventures, it needs to license the use of or be transferred ownership of intellectual property from the parties involved. In general speaking, it's best for the joint venture if it receives full rights and is transferred the intellectual property to the joint venture. But that cannot always happen, as often the parties that own the intellectual property still need it for their general businesses. In this case, the joint venture usually signs an ancillary agreement which gives them nearly identical rights to the owning party. This IP ancillary agreement usually gives the joint venture an unlimited international royalty-free license. This includes the right to sub-license depending on exclusivity agreed in the contracts. There is one thing to note here about trademark licenses. If the party that holds the license files for bankruptcy, their trademark license is cancelable. For most other kinds of intellectual property, the licenses are guaranteed. As you can imagine, the licensing agreements themselves are extensive. These agreements often include issues such as royalties, agreement duration, cancellation, and tax and antitrust considerations. They also outline the license scope and developments, as well as sub-licensing and cross-licensing rights and obligations. In addition to IP agreements, employee agreements are also common and vital to a joint venture's success. Generally speaking, these employees are not hired directly for the joint venture, but are originally employees of the parties involved. These employees fall under two categories, which are based on the joint venture itself. If the joint venture's duration will be limited, employees are usually seconded, meaning loaned or leased, from their main employers to the joint venture. When the joint venture has an extended or indefinite duration, or when it's in a delayed buyout, the parties transfer their employees to the joint venture. Those employees are then employees of the joint venture itself, not one of the parties involved. The ancillary employees agreements outline the rights of the employee in relation to their original employer. This includes whether or not they will return to their original employer when they are no longer needed by the joint venture and if they have the right to solicit their original employer. Things get especially complicated when employees are seconded to the joint venture. The only exception here is when the joint venture is in a regulated industry. In this case, there might already be requirements in place determining which entity the employees technically work for. One of the biggest hurdles 
in negotiating an ancillary employment agreement is determining which business the original party or the joint venture is responsible for employee management. Basically, the businesses need to decide who will hire, who will evaluate this discipline, and terminate the employees loaned out to the joint venture. This ultimately depends on multiple factors, including whether or not the joint venture has a HR capacity to handle employee management. Basically, the businesses need to decide who will hire and evaluate or terminate the employees loaned out to the joint venture. This ultimately depends on multiple factors, including whether or not the joint venture has the HR capacity to handle employees management. Another vital part of the ancillary employee agreement negotiation process is determining any prior benefit agreements with the employee as well as any benefits arrangements. Prior benefit agreements may stipulate pre-closing liabilities. This might include pension and other contribution obligations and accrued bonuses amongst other prior benefits. What must be determined in the ancillary agreement is whether it's the current party of the joint venture that assumes the liabilities and related assets. If any employee makes a full transfer to the joint venture, their original employment agreement, including all compensation and benefits with the original employer, will likely to be affected. A transfer also impacts benefits such as equity compensation, subsidized health coverage, retirement benefits, and retirement matching contributions. What happens to these benefits is often determined by how the employee's original employment agreement ends. If it ends via termination, they may no longer be eligible to collect their outstanding benefits. That being said, uh, termination could also trigger accelerated vesting, which would benefit the employee greatly from this. And ultimately, the ancillary employment agreement must detail how employees will be compensated for any actual or perceived losses they incur from transferring to the joint venture. It's not just prior benefits that need to be agreed upon, uh, new benefits also need to be decided. And for many joint ventures, these benefits include general employee benefit plans and equity stake for new employees. In this part of the agreement, the parties must decide whether one of the parties or the joint venture itself will provide benefit plans to the transfer joint venture employees. Once that's agreed upon, they then must decide if those benefits will be identical to one of the parties or if they will be developed only for the joint venture. For those joint ventures that offer equity stake in a company, many considerations must be evaluated. This includes the form of equity offered, liquidity, and vesting rights and provisions, also taxes and the impact of termination. Some joint ventures offer what's known as phantom equity. This is a usually performance-based incentive. Generally, these new benefits are reserved for transferred employees, not those who are simply seconded for a limited amount of time. This is especially true during a delayed payout. Often the party with the highest stake in the joint venture grants equity to its employees. However, as always, other factors are involved, including ensuring that the equity won't create distractions or conflicts for the employees. Other important issues included in the discussion surrounding new benefits are equity compensation plan permits, dilution, and non-cash accounting expenses. Next up, we'll be talking more about antitrust and other regulations. So guys, for now, take a brief break to scratch your legs and give your eyes a break from this screen. As always, feel free to take a day or two to go over what we've learned in this section before moving on if that's what works best for you. Welcome back. In this section, we'll be covering antitrust and other regulatory considerations. You might remember that 
we briefly mentioned antitrust in the previous lesson. As a refresher, antitrust relates to the law of competition. Knowing that joint ventures are pro-competitive, often developing new and groundbreaking products or services. Antitrust laws ensure joint ventures encourage competition instead of monopolizing a particular market in a country. Prior to beginning a joint venture, the parties must consider any possible anti-competitive effects or impacts that could infringe upon antitrust status. For certain joint ventures, pre-clearance from antitrust authorities may be required in jurisdictions that will be impacted by its formation. And here you need the advice or assistance of specialized lawyers in antitrust law. Because antitrust laws are especially important when two competing businesses create a joint venture, knocking out any other competition from the market. In these cases, antitrust analysis has to determine if the pro-competitive nature of the joint venture makes up for the initially eliminated competition. This analysis is also used to ensure joint ventures are not just a mask for illegal price fixing agreements. Another consideration is whether or not a joint venture between competing businesses will affect other markets or industries. For example, in, if both parties exchange research or other information, what risk is there to the competition in those other markets. This risk could be through raising or reducing prices, innovation, quality, or other outputs. It could also happen through conclusion or foreclosing rivals. So safe courts are put into place to limit these possible effects, including segregating employees and creating information firewalls. In the United States, specifically, a hard Scott Rodino filing is often required when a joint venture takes the legal form of a corporation or partnership. For the corporations, if any of the joint venture partners receive over 66 million US dollars in stocks, this filing is almost always required. For partnerships, the HSR filing is usually only necessary if one of the parties in the joint venture has the rise to 50% or more of the profits or 50% or more of the assets. In this case, that party is known as the party in control of the joint venture, so the controlling party. And this party is considered to have 100% of the partnership assets. If those assets exceed 66 million, they will likely have to do this filing. So generally speaking, no filing is necessary if a joint venture is a contractual agreement, no new entity is formed, and no assets are transferred. Outside of the United States, there are over 100 countries that require filings for certain kinds of transactions, including joint ventures. Filings are most often required when asset ownership or control over a business changes hands. Like tax jurisdictions, there are also antitrust law jurisdictions, and each has its own laws joint ventures must follow. Again, like with taxes, joint ventures need to declare where their assets will be kept and sales will be made in order to determine if any filing is necessary. In addition to adding by antitrust laws, joint ventures based in regulated industries might need approval from certain government authorities or agencies, especially if one party is a foreign company or natural person. These regulated industries include banking, insurance, transportation, healthcare, amongst many others. So if you think you've got some concentration left, next up we're talking about investment accounting for joint venture. See you there. Welcome back. Let's jump right in. In this section, we'll be discussing investment accounting in joint ventures. In joint ventures, investments are accounted for in accordance with ACG 323 using the equity method for accounting. This method is used to keep track of investments in associated companies or entities when the investor owns between 20 
till 50% of its stock. But if the carrying value of an investor's investment drops to zero due to the losses in the joint venture, they should stop using the equity method. They should only begin using it again when their share of the new net income is equal to its net losses while the equity method was not being used. Meanwhile, when an investor controls a joint venture owning over 50% of its stocks, as we discussed in our last lesson, the consolidation method of accounting will be used. In the meantime, the investors of the remaining 50% will still use the equity method. To understand the equity method a bit better, you should know that the initial investment is recorded at costs and it's then adjusted moving forward based on the investor's share of the joint venture and its income or losses. When it comes to the book value of investments, meaning what it is on the balance sheet, it can be reduced based on distributions such as dividends. The final amount of an investor's share can be found in one line on the investor's income statement. So now, as we've previously talked about, some founding parties in joint ventures contribute assets in the form of a business. The fair value of that business is then recorded as an investment amount. Sometimes investors have loss or gain in this investment if the fair value of the business differs from its book value. Meanwhile, for the regular contribution of assets, such as cash after the initial book value, is recorded before the initial contribution, no gains or losses are recorded. This difference means there needs to be a strict line between what's considered a business and what is an individual asset. However, making that determination is a lot more complicated than it sounds. This is because sometimes a group of individual assets that operate as a unit is classified as one business instead of as individual assets. And there is often a difference between the underlying equity in a joint venture's net assets and the book value of an investor's investment. This is because of the investor's proportionate interest in a joint venture's assets and the amortization of those assets used for lives. In general, intercompany profits or losses are due to asset sales to the joint venture. In this case, profit is eliminated to the point of the joint venture investor's interest. When there are temporal differences in the taxable and distributed earnings of domestic corporate joint ventures, the fair taxes, meaning the obligation to pay taxes in the future, are allowed under ACG 740. And with that, we finish up lesson two of this course. You are doing great so far, and I'm looking forward to see you in the lesson number three.